Madam Speaker, I'm, I wanted to speak to this uh, concurrence debate on this report of the Standing Committee on Human Resources, Skills and Social Development and the Status of Persons with Disabilities because housing is an important topic to my constituents and also an important topic to, to all Canadians. And Madam Speaker, I think it's safe to say that we have a housing crisis in Canada. This government, over the last eight years, has presided over this crisis. And while provinces have a role to play, and so do municipalities, Madam Speaker, what I hope to make clear to the House in my short remarks is that the primary responsibility for this mess is with the Government of Canada. The Government of Canada has huge macroeconomic levers not available to the provinces. They regulate our banking system through the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions. They regulate the mortgage market through CMHC's mortgage insurance programs. And Finance Canada plays a big role in regulating our financial services sector. And these, by far and away, are the cause of the housing crisis in Canada. And none of the initiatives that the government has announced as part of a plethora of programs on housing is going to offset the macroeconomic mistakes that they have made over the last eight years. We truly have a crisis in two forms. It's a crisis in terms of housing prices. Madam Speaker, let's be frank and candid here. Canada has a housing bubble. It's a bubble of epic proportions that has gone on for so long that we don't even see it for what it is. And how did we get this housing bubble? Well, quite simply, the government mismanaged a number of macroeconomic policies through Finance Canada, through CMHC, and through OSFI. For example, they allowed mortgage credit to grow at an unbelievable annual compounded rate over the last eight years, far in excess of inflation, population growth, and other uh, measures like productivity growth. And as a result, household debt in Canada has grown from 80% of GDP some 15 years ago to 107% of GDP today. That's a 27% jump in household debt in Canada. That's more than, that's almost 30%, that's a 30% jump, more than a 30% jump in household debt in real terms, per household in this country, over the last 15 years, most of it under this government's watch. And all because this government failed to regulate the growth in mortgage credit through OSFI, through Finance Canada, and through CMHC. I'll give you one example of their mismanagement. In the early days of the pandemic, OSFI relaxed the domestic stability buffer, allowing banks to loan out hundreds of billions of dollars in new money. And OSFI put no restrictions on this money being loaned out. And what happened? Well, it was all loaned out for, almost all of it was loaned out for residential real estate. And it poured fuel on the fire of housing, which is why housing prices during the pandemic skyrocketed. The government should have said, look, we're going to inject some liquidity into the system but we're not going to allow the financial sector to put all of its eggs in one basket into residential mortgages and pour fuel on the fire of housing prices. And that's one big reason why housing has skyrocketed over the last several years. There are so many other things that the government did. They argued against the B20 rule and they forced financial regulators to weaken down the B20 rule. Well, what situation do we have today? We have a situation where one-fifth of all of CIBC mortgages are ones where the borrowers aren't even paying the interest on their loan balances, and their principal is getting bigger. And as a result, Madam Speaker, we are looking down the barrel of a financial crisis. In about two short years, many of the mortgages that were given out during the pandemic come up for renewal. Most of these are five-year term mortgages. And most of these mortgages are fixed monthly payment variable rate. And when those mortgage holders renew, about a quarter of all mortgages outstanding, 
they're going to be faced with a crisis because renewal mandates that the mortgage renews at the original amortization track that the mortgage was originally supposed to be on when the term was originally negotiated. And so, M Madam Speaker, as a result, people are looking at a 20 to 40 percent jump in their mortgage payments in about two short years. And that, those figures come from Desjardins, research analysts. Those figures come from the Bank of Canada itself. And that is on the best case scenario, Madam Speaker. That is a best case scenario. That's if rates start to drop early next year, and it's not clear they will because the bank continues to hike this past month alone. It may hike further. It's predicated on us having a mild recession that we get out of fairly quickly, and it's predicated on rates dropping to 2.5% pretty quickly. Those are all a Goldilocks scenario that may not come to pass. And even in that Goldilocks scenario, rates, payments for these mortgages are still expected to jump 20 to 40 percent. And if a worst case scenario comes to pass, the payment jumps could be much higher. And Madam Speaker, we're talking about a fifth to a quarter of all outstanding mortgages that are in this situation. And that's a direct result of this government's mismanagement of the banking system. Madam Speaker, we have a second crisis in our system that the government isn't addressing at all, and that is a lack of housing supply. And what has happened, Madam Speaker, over many years, is that the supply of purpose-built apartment buildings has plummeted. Several decades ago, more than two-thirds of Canadians rented an apartment in a purpose-built apartment building. But I looked up the data for the number of apartment buildings that have been built in the last several decades, and it's plummeted to almost nothing. In fact, in the province of Ontario, 86% of all apartment building stock was built prior to 1980. Almost none of it was built after the 1980s. And as a result, only 60% of renters in Canada today rent an apartment in a purpose-built apartment building. The other 40% of renters are renting a house, a room in a house, a condo, or some other non-purpose-built apartment. And as a result, we have a government focused entirely on the wrong solution to the problem, which is to build more houses and condos. What we need, Madam Speaker, are more purpose-built apartment buildings. But the government isn't thinking about these macroeconomic policies because they're focused on microeconomic policies that are not going to make a difference. The slowdown in apartment construction coincides with the introduction of capital gains taxes on apartment buildings that don't apply to primary residents. It coincides with negative changes to capital cost allowances that didn't allow private developers to write off their investments in a way that made it financially viable. It, it, apply, it is a result of GST rules that favor one type of housing over another. It's a result of CMHC introducing restrictions on underwriting of rental housing. It's a result of a range of other issues that the government has failed to address. And until the government addresses these macroeconomic policies, whether it is the growth in mortgage credit that has led to a housing bubble, or whether it is the lack of rental housing through purpose-built apartment buildings, we are not going to be able to address this crisis. And for all those reasons, Madam Speaker, I encourage members of this House to think about the, the uh, what the committee has found in this report and to consider the broader picture as to how we got into this situation, a situation that's not just a housing crisis, but one that really could put the financial stability of our entire Canadian banking system at risk. Thank you, Madam Speaker.